ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय आई बो टू द लॉर्ड वासुदेव द लॉर्ड इज इन ऑल बीइंग्स इन ऑल मास्टर्स एंड आल्सो इन यू एंड द ओनली डिफरेंस बिटवीन यू एंड me on the one hand and the great masters on the other is that we're still asleep in delusion we have to wake up it's only that you don't have to attain anything somebody there was a very nice passage in the in the autobiography of a yogi by paramhansa yogananda in which a <clears throat> disciple is asking the guru for minute instructions on the spiritual path and the guru says it makes me laugh to see a fish in in water a thirst we have that consciousness we don't need so much these minute instructions people seem to think that just if you turn one hand the wrong way something will not happen and god will curse you you are in him already what you need to do is think about him and the techniques of yoga are useful because they help you to think about him they're not they're not rituals they have a directional purpose they help to calm the mind to direct the pran the energy upward to focus it these are what are needed these plus uh, absolute desire for that so that all the energy goes up and it isn't as in everybody's case who is still in delusion sort of a, a tug of war between maya and spiritual aspiration and the reason the path takes a long time is because of that tug of war you say yes i want god but uh, it would be so nice if i had that new house that kind of thinking keeps us going for many incarnations there is a beautiful but very short saying that i want to read from conversations with yogananda During the last months of the master's life someone gave him an expensive Cadillac car he referred to it several times as his hangman's dinner you know he explained when someone is about to be executed by hanging it is traditional to give him the best dinner possible divine mother wanted us to send off to give me something special because my work in this lifetime is finished well he had a charming sense of humor and he could joke about that but uh indeed he was he was very simple he didn't like to have anything and whatever he had he wanted to give away one time there was a sweet little story he had somebody had given him some money and he wanted to give it to us so we could go out and buy ice cream so he said uh, it's kind of hot today isn't it and we answered well it's not all that hot so we knew what he wanted to offer and we didn't we felt embarrassed he said are you sure it isn't hot so we we answered well it is if you say so sir and then he said i was so charming he said i can't keep money and i won't and so he gave us 5 dollars to go out and buy some ice cream well he um he didn't want to have such a beautiful thing but he accepted it uh, in a jocular spirit as divine mother's hangman's dinner you know living with him as i did for three and a half years and having so many wonderful memories it's sort of when you think of the gopis reflecting on the days of krishna and go uh, in uh, in gokula and uh, after krishna left there and had to begin his life mission there was still that nostalgia and So sometimes when I read these conversations they come very al- alive to me. It was you know you you go along like this and then suddenly you ha- climb a high mountain and you go on like this. But there's such golden memories. You can't imagine what it was like to live with a great man of God. so many people in india don't they either haven't read his autobiography of a yogi after all he was his mission was in the west or 
They've read it and they think, what a sweet, charming, beautiful young man, and how lucky he was to meet all those great saints. They don't realize what a great master he was. Listen, for an Indian teacher to go to America and keep intact his own principles, his own high culture, and yet adapt it to the country in the right way, I have seen a lot of teachers come from India, and I've never seen one handle it as well as he did. He was always just, what to live with him was, uh, was an experience in, in uh, to, it was totally different from anything we ever saw in our culture. And of course, the mistake that Americans can make is seeing somebody like that, they come to India and they sort of expect that every Indian will be a guru and they sort of, uh, it's not quite this ridiculous, but expect somebody uh, anywhere they go to slap them on the chest and they'll go into samadhi. Well, as you know, as I know, India isn't like that. You sometimes meet some great ones and you meet a lot of other people and I don't have to describe them because they're like everybody in the world. People, the big problem with human beings is ego. But when you meet somebody who doesn't have an ego, at first it's a bit of a shock. You, can, you, 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 you don't know how to handle somebody that great. You know, there's a saying, no man is great in the eyes of his own valet or valet. And uh, this is probably true in the world, but those who are the closest to my guru were the ones who held him in the greatest respect and reverence. It wasn't a phony thing. It wasn't something you put on because, oh, here is the guru I'm supposed to. You couldn't help feeling like that. And yet, at the same time, he could be so... He wasn't like a Himalayan yogi, sort of always talking as if from a mountain top like this. Oh, he had a wonderful sense of humor and uh, could be so sweet and so charming. And yet still, you felt behind that there was this great... Uh, vast consciousness, that it wasn't even a condescension, because there was no sense of I'm here and you're there. There was no sense of I at all. And so his life, which toward the end of it began to be, we began to feel a nostalgia because we knew that it wasn't going to be much longer. I know that uh, I thought he would come back to India. He planned to come back here three years in a row. Each year he was going to bring me and a few others with him. And uh, so I did think he would come back here and uh, leave his body in India, but it was his mission to go to the West, so it was right that he leave his body also in the West. I know that only one person said that uh, he had said to her, it's only a matter of hours. But the last day was, he. you know, the Ambassador Shen, Abhinay R. Shen from India, uh, had come to Los Angeles and he came up to Mott Washington. I remember serving them. Sean Desh is a picture of me doing that. And uh, the last few days were taken up with sort of uh, bringing India and America together in that way. But the last night, somebody had sent him some green coconuts, and he remembered the green coconuts in Calcutta, and he was joyfully eating these coconuts, and I just couldn't help feeling there was a sort of an aura of unreality around it. And he looked at me and, and went on joking, but I just, I, it didn't seem uh, quite, it seemed as if he was putting on an act, because he knew that this was the last time he would be with us except for just going out to the big banquet at the Biltmore Hotel the next day, and I was there too when he left his body. And as, as he was getting into the elevator, he said, I have a big day tomorrow, wish me luck. We didn't understand what he meant. He meant a big day, the end of days for that life. And so when he went to the Biltmore Hotel, I was with, uh, sitting with Dick Hames, who was a famous singer and also an actor in Hollywood. And uh, I was sort of uh, partly talking with him, partly listening to Master, and I was writing down Master's words. 
And all of a sudden, because I wasn't looking, I was busy writing, just suddenly there was this shout or scream, and I looked up and I said, what happened? And they came and said, he's fainted. I thought, oh, no, he doesn't faint. I knew there was something much more than that. And I had always wanted to be a playwright as a, as a young man. And uh, it just suited my sense of drama. What more dramatic way to leave his body. Years earlier, he had said, I know when I die in joy I will sigh for India. And uh, in another one, he said that I want to die with my boots on. And in another time, he said, I will die speaking of my India and my America. And his final talk was on that subject. He was saying that between these two cultures, America and India, there is something that they have in common which they need to bring into unity. When I see people in India all trying to become Americanized, they always get the cat by the wrong end. You can't feed the tail, you've got to feed the mouth. They always forget that the culture is not just the glitz. The real America is something much deeper. There is something wonderful in America. It's first of all, there is a spiritual hunger there. People want to know God. They believe in freedom to worship as, as one chooses. They believe in fairness. But I think in the, the most apposite thing, the most important thing, as regards its relationship with India, is this. That many years ago, in 1959, I think it was, there was a young man who was in business, and I uh, suggested to him something he might do that would improve his business. Well, I may have been right, I may have been wrong. The interesting thing in this story isn't whether I was right or wrong. It's that he answered me, well, but you see, sir, this is what my father did. As if that settled it. India is so steeped in tradition that it's hard to break that. Now that Indians are becoming, becoming so expert at computers, nobody can say, well, my, com my father did computers this way. So it forces them to break tradition. Now, in America, this it's of all countries, the most likely, the most inclined to think, how can we improve on things? It's, uh, there's a funny story about a, a group of people from different countries who are asked to write an essay on the elephant. And the English student wrote about the aristocratic character of the elephant. And the German wrote about how to use the elephant in time of war. And the Frenchman used, uh, wrote about lovemaking among the elephants. And the Italian wrote about the uh, musical trumpet of the elephant. The American wrote on, about how to make bigger and better elephants. And this sort of is the American way. Too often they think they equate bigger with better. But still, how many great inventions have come from America? They're coming from other countries too, but I'm just saying this is the particular genius of America to always think, how can I do it better? Well, that's something that people need in India too, because the traditions are from an old time when um, People had to, they had to be given forms because they couldn't understand the inwardness. Now we're in living in an age of energy. My Param Guru said it is Dwapara Yuga. I know that Indians generally think of it as Kali. Well, okay, call it what you like, but it is an age of energy. People think more in terms of energy. And uh, it, all those old ways of worship, for instance, why do you do Arati? Ultimately, it's an outward symbol of offering yourself to God, the light that is in you being offered up into the infinite light. Why do you do puja? It's not a thing in itself. It's a symbol of offering all your senses up to the infinite. Why do you do yajna? To burn up your past karmas in the fire, in the havankund. But all of these outward symbols, you're beautiful and fine mustn't be overlooked in the sense of they are the reality, because the real puja, the real yagna, the real arati, 
is a matter of inwardly offering your pran up to God. Now, in an age when people didn't know energy, when people couldn't understand that matter itself is really only a vibration of energy, when to them matter was real, it was much more difficult to think in terms of yoga. Yoga in those days, and even today, is hatha yoga, physical positions, things you can see and touch and feel. <clears throat> but the truth is that real yoga and real pranayama, prana means not just breath, it means energy. Breath control helps to control the energy, but the real meaning of pranayama means to be able to bring your energy under control and withdraw it from the senses. As my guru used to say, I practiced as a boy, shutting off the senses one by one. And uh, with this practice, you uh, can in deep meditation raise your energy. When you feel devotion in the heart, don't offer it outward to Krishna or Kali or anything. Yes, do that too, that's fine. But realize that the real devotion is inside. You really, when you feel love bursting your heart with devotion, don't spill it in outward emotion. You won't get anywhere that way. It'll feel good for a while, and then where will you be? Take that feeling and direct it up the spine to this. That is where yoga comes in very handy. In fact, you need it. Because it teaches you how the life force flows in the spine. This is the canal through which all your energy flows. This is why swamis often carry a danda. The danda is to remind them to be straight in their spine so the energy can flow freely in the spine. When I think of my guru, I remember how firmly he always brought us back to that truth. and He never wavered from it. That is what I'm trying my best to convey to you. In my coming to India, I have nothing to give you but him. And what he had to give was something new for the world. And a combination of this devotion with aspiration, with activity outwardly, all done with God consciousness. These are golden memories, and therefore I wanted to sing to you, and I won't be doing it myself, but friends of mine will sing to you a song that I wrote called Memories. Joy to you. Evening garden, silent fountain, glimmering stars in its depths, a sudden leaf falling toward the water, ripples bring Dream.